Well, yes, you do, Father. Thank you for that great, wonderful love that you've given all of us and that propels you to come back for us one day and receive us so that we can be where you are. Thank you for that. We praise you. We rejoice in that great love. And Father, we, 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 we know that it is that love that has changed our lives and saved our souls and worked in us in all these miraculous ways and keeps hanging on to us and keeps working with us in spite of everything. And Father, we praise you. We, we love you. We rejoice in that. We pray it in Jesus' name and all God's people said, amen, amen, amen. All right, praise the Lord. All right, you guys. Yeah, my goodness. Well, I'm excited about this new series. I, I really am. I, let me tell you just a second of how it, how it came about. Uh, you know, we had uh, big, we had about 30, 35 of our people had COVID all at the same time. Tanya and I were, were two of them and um, we were all quarantined. And so, of course, that means I'm quarantined from driving the bus and doing other things that I do. And so I'm at home all day long, and it's just me and Tanya. And, um, and of course, that's fine. Uh, we've been together for 43 years, so, uh, you know, we know how to be together. And uh, <laughs> we've been together a lot. And, um, but I start, you know, I, I, I just start praying about direction from the Lord, about what he would have me to focus on because I couldn't focus on any, you know, for the last three or four messages that I've preached, it's been about the rapture, you know, or the second coming, or, or signpost to the, to the end times and so forth. Because uh, I don't know why. I, I mean, am I, am I trying to hurry it up? You know, am I, am I looking forward to better days? Well, yes, I am, you know. Am I, is it a form of escapism, you know, that I would be working on and all of that? And all these things going through your mind. And any of you that have had COVID, you know how it does you. It messes up your thinking. I, I, you know, it did mine. Um, kind of affects you. I can't even really describe it. It doesn't make you where you forget everything, but it makes you where you don't care about most things and, and you don't uh, focus real well. You have to really kind of make yourself focus. And then, you get, and then the, the second thing to go along with that is it makes you irritable, really irritable uh, about anything, anything. It doesn't matter what it is. The wind blows wrong. I mean, you're all over it. And um, so anyway, with all those feelings involved, I'm saying to the Lord, Lord, you, you know, you have a word for me to speak to the church and to our people and to those that, that listen. And, you know, I don't want to be affected by this. I don't want this to be my, my, uh, my, my, my trampoline to, to, to come off of and, and just, you know, be um, angry or bitter or whatever it, you might be uh, in that kind of condition. I don't know if you've ever noticed this, but it's really hard to be creative when you are in that kind of condition. I don't know how people do it that, that, you know, I don't know how you are creative when you can't think right and you don't feel right and all of that. But I'm just telling you that you do. And so I didn't want to be affected by that. So I said, Lord, give me, you know, what is it that, that, that would be something that you would say to me and say to them? And the Lord inspired this series. And here's what happened. Uh, I mentioned to you at a message a few weeks ago, and some of you have even mentioned this to me, that you had never thought of this and that no one had ever said this to you. And I've told you that there have been people through the years that said to me, when I would ask them if they're going to heaven when they die, they would say, no, and I don't want to go. And I'm thinking, you would rather go to hell and burn forever than go to a wonderful place called heaven? And the answer was yes, because, and I said, why? And they would, and it would be some form of this. It wouldn't be this every time, but it'd be some form of this. Well, I just think heaven's going to be boring. Uh, you know, floating around on a cloud all day. Come on, man. I'm, I mean, I, I like being there and, and not being in hell, but I mean, how much cloud floating can you do and really stay sane, you know? And then you play the harp and you float on a cloud and, and that just sounds boring to me. I mean, forever? You're going to do that forever? Eternity? That's going to be with it? Well, I, I put that in, the, in my memory banks in the back and, and, and the Lord chose <laughs> this time to pull it out, um, to remember that and to say, well, you know, there are a lot of Christians that probably think that. There are probably a lot of Christians. Now, I'm not saying that Christians would say, I don't want to go to heaven, but you're not all fired up about it. 
You're not excited about it. As a matter of fact, I've seen people, when I talk about the rapture, and it could be at any moment, the look on their face was, I hope it's not, because I'm in the eighth grade, and I'd like to live my life, you know? I'd like to get married, have some children, you know? Well, I, you might better reconsider that, but, um, but they, that, that is what they think. They think, you know, I'm young, I want to live, I want, as if heaven somehow stops everything about life. And that, it, and that it is indeed floating around on a cloud and playing a harp and standing in front of the Lord with our hands up and whatever you imagine that is okay for a while, but you can't imagine yourself being happy and joyful doing that for, the, for eternity because eternity has no end, <laughs> right? All right, so I said, all right, Lord, let, let, me, just, let me just look in the Word and let me just see what the Bible has to say about what it, we're going to be like. Not, not some Tom and Jerry cartoon now. Not some Roadrunner and Coyote cartoon where they got the little pictures of the angels fluttering around and the harps. And, you know, that's where, sadly, that's where a lot of us learn our theology is on movies and TV shows and so forth. It's just what somebody made up and think, what does, what does the, the source of truth have to say about what heaven's going to be like? Does it have very much to say about this thing? And I'm telling you, if any of you have the outline in your hand, look at that third point down there. Turn over on the back and look at that third point and look at all those scriptures that are written across the top of there. I wrote all those scriptures down, put them in your notes so you would have them because I know whenever I say them today, you're going to let them, I mean, unless you got a quick pen and all that, they're just going to fly by. I put them in your notes so that you could have them. You could go home and read them because it is, the Bible is filled with information about what heaven is going to be like for us. And the reason people don't get excited about it is because they don't know anything about it. And the Bible starts in Matthew, well, I'm going to start actually in Luke 21. In Luke 21, it's going to kind of be our base scripture. And the reason I'm using Luke 21 as the base scripture is because it's the one that tells you why I believe everything that I'm saying to you. It's, it's Jesus himself speaking. And here's what Jesus says about the, the, the end times. He says, this is beginning at verse 25, Luke 21. And there will be signs in the sun, in the moon, and in the stars, and on earth distress of nations. Do we have distress of nations? All right, check that box. With perplexity, that means with no answers. All right, check that box. Uh, the sea and the waves roaring. Now, I know uh, if you've studied prophecy at all in any book in the Bible, when you see the sea and waves roaring and, and the ocean, it, that's, that is prophetic uh, imagery for groups of people, for big, large nations of people and groups of people. So what this is saying is, this is not some global warming word right here that the waves are going to start having big waves. No, this is talking about that the nations of the world are going to be in turmoil and in distress. They're going to be upset. They're going to be in, uh, unpredictable in their actions. Men's hearts failing them from fear. That's the word phobos, from which we get our English word, obviously, phobia, which means terror or fear. Jesus is talking about terrorism here. He's saying in the last days, there's going to be terror on this earth. And it's going to scare men to death. Not just for what happens now, but, look, but the next line says, man's heart failing from them from fear and the expectation of those things which are coming on the earth. You know what, you know the worst thing about terrorism? It's not actually what's happening right now. It's what are they going to do next? I mean, I'm watching San Francisco blow up. Oh, it's all right if San Francisco blows up because I'm way down here in Mississippi. But are they coming to Mississippi? Do you think that, that when I walk into Walmart down here, it's going to blow up one day? Fear. Terrorism. Jesus said that's what it's going to be like. For the powers of the heavens will be shaken. 
Then they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud. That's the rapture. With power and great glory. Now here's the line I want you to really pay attention to. Verse 28. Now when these things begin to happen, when these things begin to happen, look up and lift up your heads because your redemption draws near. So Jesus says all these things, and he says much more in other places about identifying certain things, but this group right here is good enough for me. He says, when you see these things begin to happen, you will know that you are in the end. And you will know that the end's not going to take long to get completed. He said, as soon as you see it, you look up, not a uh, hundred years from now, a thousand years from now, to a couple of millennia from now, but when you see these things begin to happen, you lift up your eyes and look because your redemption is right around the corner. And the reason people don't know anything about heaven is because they don't know anything about redemption. The key to heaven is the word redemption. Lift up your eyes, lift up your head, because what? Your redemption draws near. What does redemption mean? It means to, right, it means to redeem something. It means to buy it back. It means to purchase it again. What is this verse saying? Jesus is saying, hey, look, when the Son of Man comes on those clouds with great power and great glory, He's going to bring your redemption with him. In other words, Jesus on the cross shed his blood for us to pay our penalty for sin so that we wouldn't have to pay the penalty ourselves. God created us. God owns us. God built us. God, we are God's children. We are made in the image of God no matter what the evolutionists say. We are created in God's image and he created us. And then Adam and Eve chose to sin against God in the Garden of Eden and they fell all the way from glory to leaves, from light to leaves. They lost everything. And then Jesus came and went to a cross and shed his blood on that cross so that all of us would be bought back again. We would be redeemed God would own us again. We would belong to him again. And so when we come to Christ and we accept him as our Savior, his blood makes a down payment on total redemption that Jesus is going to bring back when he comes back to get us. We have what the old King James Version used to call a foretaste of the glory of God. We have a foreshadowing of things to come. We have the Holy Spirit living on the inside of us as God's down payment for what the ultimate redemption is going to be like. So what I'm saying to you is when Jesus comes back, he gives us everything back that Adam and Eve lost. If they had it in the garden when they were created and they sinned and they lost it all, the earth was cursed, cursed. Uh, women were cursed, men were cursed, uh, the crops were cursed, the weather was cursed, everything was cursed by God and fell under, under the, the, the curse of God. So they lost everything. Their wonderful bodies that would live forever and never die. They lost their great pleasure. They were created in Eden, which by, which by the way means delight. They were cre created in the land of pleasure. They lived in Pleasureville. But when they sinned, they lost that. God gave them authority over all of the earth and everything on the earth. And when they sinned, they lost that. And their home they lived in a garden called paradise. And they got kicked out of their home. And their intimacy with each other and with God. They lived with God. God lived with them. 
He created them so he could live with them. Every day he came down, he talked with them, he walked with them, he shared with them, they shared with him. Nothing was hidden, nothing was covered, nothing was closed. But when they sinned, they tried to hide themselves in leaves because they were ashamed. And they lost the intimacy of life that all of us still seek, not only with God, but even with each other. What does redemption do? Redemption gives us back everything that was lost when man sinned and fell in the Garden of Eden. Your redemption. Look up at, when you see these things, lift up, lift up your head. Look, think on God is what he's saying. Get your eyes off the world. Get your eyes off of that, that depravity and that stuff that's going to bring you down and depress you and discourage you. Get your eyes off of all that stuff. Look up, lift up your eyes. It's time to focus on God. It's not time to focus on everything around you. Focus on him. Because soon he'll be back and he's going to be bringing redemption with him. Therefore, three truths about our redeemed bodies. What are they going to be like? Truth number one. Our earthly bodies, here's truth about, redeem, about our glorified body. Our earthly bodies are temporary, and one day we will have heavenly bodies. When God created Adam and Eve, they were perfect. They had everything that God created for them. They were created uh, with all perfection. Uh, they were the complete package. They, they had it all, but they lost it when they fell they lost everything, now listen, including the glory of God, which the Apostle Paul says is the essence of sin, by the way. For all have sinned, Romans 3 says. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So one of the great things we lost was the glory of God. And, and so Jesus died on the cross and he returned from glory and he, and, and, and he, and he, gave, he gave us the first fruits of down payment of everything that was going to come. But when he returns from paradise, he's going to restore everything we lost when, when Adam and Eve sinned. All right, Romans 8. I wish you could see this. Go home and read it. <laughs> Romans 8, verse 18 through 24. Listen to this. Yet what we suffer now is nothing compared to the glory that he will reveal to us later. For, listen, all creation is waiting eagerly for that future day when God will reveal who his real children are. All of creation is waiting because all of creation is cursed. The earth right now is saying, come Jesus, because the earth has been cursed. Thorns and thistles you'll bring forth and weeds and mosquitoes and gnats and no see them. The whole earth is saying, come on Jesus. Creation is saying, come on Jesus. All the plants are going, come on Jesus. All the, every, all the animals are going, come on Jesus. All of creation is eagerly awaiting God's children being revealed for who they are. Verse 29, against its will, listen to this, against its will, all creation was subjected to God's curse. But with eager hope, the creation looks forward to the day when it will join God's children in glorious freedom from death and decay. We're all dying, right? We're all decaying, right? I know I, I look like I'm going real slow, but uh, if you look real close, you can see some decay, all right? I will be honest about that. All right, verse 22. For we know that all creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. And we, be and we believers also groan even though we have the Holy Spirit within us as a foretaste of future glory, for we long for our bodies to be released from sin and suffering. We too wait with eager hope for the day when God will give us our full rights as his adopted children, including the new bodies he has promised us. We were given this hope 
when we were saved. So what are we waiting on? What is creation waiting on? What is the earth crying out for? For the return of Jesus so that everything that was lost can be returned. Adam and Eve and all of creation was created gloriously perfect by God and would have remained unchanged forever. Adam and Eve would look right now exactly like they looked on the day they were created. The Garden of Eden would be the perfect paradise just like it was on the day it was created. God created it perfectly and God intended it to be perfect. They would look the same way. They would act the same way. They would have no pains, no weaknesses, no defects. Had they not sinned, they would have, and this is a big theological word, provisional immortality. They'd live forever, provided they obeyed. God told Adam and Eve one thing, one, one thing. You can, do, you can eat of all the trees in this garden, but that tree right out there in the middle, don't you eat, a, eat of that, because the day you do, you're going to die. And what do they do? Go straight to the tree that they couldn't eat, got it, and they immediately started dying. Thank you, Adam and Eve. They would have never gotten sick. They would have never experienced pain. They would have lived forever in perfect bodies. But because of sin, we have corrupted bodies. We get sick. We get frail. We get weak. And we die. And because we keep on living in these bodies, it's no telling what kind of damage we're doing to our own bodies simply because we're there. But when Jesus comes, we're going to understand what it's like to have full redemption in perfect bodies. Adam and Eve had them. Adam and Eve lost them. Jesus came to redeem us. We still live right now in an imperfect state. But when Jesus comes, we get our perfect bodies. This world is obsessed with bodies. Some are sick. Some have handicaps. Some are aging, to put it lightly. <laughs> Don't call me age. Oh, call me aging. Maybe you're just discouraged or depressed. Romans 8 said the entire earth is now groaning awaiting the return of Jesus. Everything that the Bible says needs to happen before Jesus came back to redeem us is happening right now on this earth right in front of our eyes. The birth pangs of his movement are getting stronger and stronger and closer and closer. And what that means is you're just about ready to get that body that Jesus has promised you and be released from all of the issues that you're dealing with right now. And you don't want to go to heaven. You want to stay in the torture chamber. This is the torture chamber. I'm 64 years old now. I'll be 65 in a few weeks. March 28th for all you that want to give gifts. Money's never bad. Never mind. <laughs> I'm 65. I'll be 65. Now, I'm really, ex I'm really kind of getting excited about it. Because when I was home with Kobe, um, I watched a lot of TV. And I saw a bunch of commercials on TV. And I'm telling you, turning 65 is something to get excited about. Because when you turn 65, according to TV, you get lots of discounts on stuff that you don't have right now. So I've been studying this thing, and I've been seeing all these hundreds of commercials. And, 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 and when I turn 65, I'm getting a reverse mortgage, a walk-in tub, and a stair lift. <laughs> I, I've, I've got it settled. I don't even have any stairs, but I'm going to get me one because it looks, it looks real nice. But, but anyway, all of us are getting older. And you know what we do? You know, I mean, young folks, you know what us older folks like to do? We like to sit around and talk to each other about what kind of pains we have. We do it all the time, right? How you feeling? Oh, man, that Arthur's killing me. That bursitis got a hold of that elbow right there. Woo! It's kind of a hobby for us, I think, is what happens. As a matter of fact, while I was working on this very series of messages, it's kind of ironic that the arthritis in my left hand was hurting me so bad I had to put a brace on my hand. Reminding me, boy, you need a glorified body. I can guarantee you that. And I even have to be careful how I get up out of my recliner, which is now my office, or I might pull a muscle getting up out of my recliner. I, it, it, it's sad. 
Well, I tell you, you know, you know pretty soon, I'm going to get a new body. <laughs> and, it, and what an upgrade it's going to be. Because my new body's going to be like Jesus. <laughs> so I'm getting excited about the fact that this old earthly body he gave me is going to move away and I get a brand new heavenly body. That's truth number one. Truth number two is the resurrected body of Jesus foreshadows what our heavenly bodies will be like. You say, what am I going to be like? What am I going to look like? Look at Jesus when he resurrected. That's what you're going to look like. I figure Jesus was probably 30 years old, 30, I mean, well, 32 or so when he resurrected. May have even been 33, you know, depending on datings that you use, all that kind of stuff. But, but regardless, 32 or 33, that's young, right? That's right in the peak of life. That's right in the prime time. That's, ooh, that's a good age, good, good time. You're old enough to know a few things and you're young enough to enjoy everything. And, and, and your bodies are strong and virile and healthy and all that. That's what Jesus was. So look, I, I know you're looking at me, but look, let me read you some word here. 1 Corinthians 15, beginning at verse 20. But now is Christ risen from the dead and has become the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. In other words, that, that's a word that, the, that the, the old Jewish people used for, uh, for being dead. But it was like sleep, you know, they, they said, okay, you'll wake up one day. But anyway, let me move on. Verse 21, for since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, this is Adam and Eve, as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. But each one in his own order, Christ the first fruits, afterward those who are Christ at his coming, then comes the end when he delivers the kingdom of God to his Father, when he puts an end to all rule and all authority and all power. All right, this verse, these verses say that Christ is the first fruits, right? We, Christ goes first, he's first fruits, then afterwards, those of us who are, belong to him, so all of us got, have a number. You've heard the phrase, your number's up? Well, this is where it came from. Jesus was the first, that means you might be number 9,979,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,
I can't recognize you when you come in a room unless some things have changed, right? Well, obviously, some things had changed with Jesus. But he said, guys, don't worry. Look at my hands. You see those scars? Boy, you look at these feet. See those holes down there in that feet? It's me. Don't be afraid. All right, let's go on. Handle me and see, he said. For a spirit does not have flesh and bones, as you see I have. When he said this, he showed him his hands and his feet. But while they still did not believe for joy and marveled, he said to them, that's just the Bible's way of saying, they were just beside themselves. They, they just really couldn't believe what they were seeing. That's what that verse means. But while they did not still believe for joy and marveled, he said to them, have you any food here? So they gave him a piece of broiled fish and some honeycomb, and he took it and ate it in their presence. Spirits don't eat. If they did, it would fall right through them. He ate this fish and this honeycomb in their presence. He's physical, guys. This is a physical person. Skip down to verse 50. And he led them out as far as Bethany, and he lifted up his hands and he blessed them. Now it came to pass while he blessed them that he was parted from them and carried up into heaven. And they worshiped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy and were continually in the temple praising and blessing God. Amen. How many of you believe in angels, by the way? You believe in angels? I believe in angels. Let me, uh, let me give you a couple of verses here. Hebrews 1.14. Hebrews 1.14. Uh, are they not all ministering spirits? The writer of Hebrews is talking about angels, and he's saying that Jesus is better than angels. But he's, say, he's telling us that angels, he says, are they not ministering spirits sent forth to minister for them who shall be the heirs of salvation? Who are the heirs of salvation? We are. So what is he saying? We've got, we've got a guardian angel around us. We've got an angel sent to minister to the heirs of salvation. All right, let me go with another one. Matthew 18. Matthew 18, this is Jesus telling the parable of the lost sheep. And in the parable of the lost sheep, here's what he says down in verse 10. Take heed that you do not despise one of these little ones, for I say to you that in heaven... Their angels always see the face of my Father who is in heaven. What's he saying? Be careful how you treat these little ones because their angels going to tell God on you because they're always in his presence. So what does that mean that we believe angels? Well, it means that there is a dimension that we don't operate in. There is a spiritual dimension where angels and spirits operate, and there is a physical dimension where we all operate. By the way, how many dimensions are there? Well, right now on the earth, there are only three. Length, width, and height. That's, that's the only way we measure things. That's, a, that's our dimensions. Acor according to uh, the bosonic string theory, we can have as many as 26, by the way. 26, <laughs> yeah, 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 20, 26. Now, I don't know anything about string theory, but that's what a lot of the scientists thinkers, blah, blah, blah. All right. All I'm going to tell you is, however many dimensions there are, your new body is going to operate in every single one of those dimensions. You know why? Because your, bo your new body is going to be supernatural, you're new, you, it's going to be supranatural, which may mean exactly the same thing. It's probably pretty close. Your body's going to be unbelievable. It's, it, 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 it's a physical body. It can, it can touch and it can feel and it can experience uh, pleasure in life. But it's also spiritual and it can move in that dimension in any way possible. I mean, uh, Luke said, you know, when Jesus appeared to these disciples, it scared them. And he, and he asked them, he said, uh, do you have anything to eat? I really want something to eat because I need you to watch me eat. Because if you watch me eat, you will know that I'm not just spiritual, but I'm actually physical also. Now, do you know why this is important? Because there are actually people 
on this earth right now and have been since the middle 400s who taught some theories about this. Great, I mean, Plato. He's a pretty big deal, right? His, Plato's teacher, he was in the mid 400s, now he's a philosopher. And he, his teacher was uh, Socrates, or as uh, Bill and Ted call him, Socrates. That's a pretty big deal. And he had a student, you know who, his most fam- who Plato's most famous student was? Aristotle. That's another big name in philosophy, right? Well, here's what Plato did. Plato taught that a, 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 a what do we want to call it? A philosophy that was called dualism. Now, here's what dualism says. I, I, I'll be off of this in just a second. Just entertain me. I like stuff like this. Um, Dualism says everything physical is bad and everything spiritual is good. That's dualism. Now, dualism was brought into the early church by a group of people called the Gnostics. I'm sure you've heard them if you've ever been in any Bible study of the New Testament. Bad group, bunch of, bunch of heretics. The Gnostics taught a heresy called docetism. Now, this is where it gets a little hairy, and I'm going to just read because I, I wrote it down because I... It's so confounded. All right, here, here's what docetism said. And here's why Jesus looked at his disciples and said, give me something to eat so he could prove he was physical. When G- here's, what the, here's docetism. When Jesus died on the cross, he only appeared to die on the cross so that we could all believe that he died for our sins. But he could not have had a physical body because everything physical is evil and everything spiritual is good. So he only appeared to come, and when he was resurrected, it was not a physical resurrection, but only a spiritual resurrection. And there's a great word for that in the Greek, and it is baloney. Well, it's actually balagna, but it, 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 Jesus, look, Jesus said, touch me. Jesus said, I want every one of you to handle me. I want every one of you to touch me. I am not a spirit. A spirit does not have flesh and blood like I have. So when you get to heaven, what am I telling you? When you get to heaven, you're going to have a physical body. You're going to have an awesome body, a supernatural body, a body that can interact with any dimension that's out there somewhere. And here's another thing that it says about Jesus' body. It can travel to heaven without a spacecraft or a space suit. Right? Remember Luke 24, 50? They went out to Bethany and without an airplane, without a helicopter, without a balloon, without a spacecraft, he just rose right up into their presence. Your body's going to be able to travel the universe at the speed of thought or whatever other speed there might be in some other dimension of life. It's fast anyway. <laughs> Just like Jesus, he just went up off the mountain right up into heaven. Your body's going to do that. The body that you get from Jesus is going to be greater than any superhero that you have ever admired in life. Batman, Superman, Wonder Woman, uh, Super Mario, Luigi, uh, any, any of them, Sonic Hedgehog, whoever he is. Man, you are going to be super. You're going to have power and, 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 and you're going to enjoy it forever. Forever. You will never lose it. Gosh, man. Tell me, you'd rather stay here, really? Man, you, this is heaven. This is what the Bible tells us about it. Verse, here's the third truth. The Bible gives clear details about our heavenly bodies. All right, let's talk about heaven for just a second. Let's talk about heaven as a comforting place for saints. Heaven as a comforting place for saints has moved. I don't know if you're aware of this. But heaven is not where it used to be. It used to be in the heart of the earth before Jesus went to heaven. I know, you say saying crazy. All right, Luke 16. Luke 16, Jesus is telling a story. He's not, this is not a parable. You know why I know? Because he names somebody in it. He says, there was a man named Lazarus. 
He doesn't, in a parable, you don't name people. A parable is, is, is just a truth laid aside so you can understand. A story has characters that are real. And if there wasn't a real Lazarus, Jesus just told a lie. And he said, there was a rich man that Lazarus was laid at his gates. So he says, there was a certain rich man and there was Lazarus. And I'm telling you, now this is stop being a parable and this is a story. And I'm telling you what heaven is. Now look, I'm going to read it. Uh, Luke 16, verse 19, And there was a certain rich man who was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. But there was a certain beggar named Lazarus, full of sores, who was laid at his gate, desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. So it was that the beggar died and was carried by the angel into Abraham's bosom, which was the name of the, the place where the departed righteous went before Jesus went to heaven. It was called Abraham's bosom. It was also called paradise. That's why Jesus looked at the thief on the cross and said, today you will be with me, not in heaven, but in paradise. You know why? Jesus is not going to heaven for, for three more days. He's going to be in paradise for three days, pumping the crowd. Abraham's bosom, paradise. Let me, let me go on now. It tells us more about this. Uh, the rich man also died and was buried and being in, being in torments in Hades, the Old Testament, that's the New Testament word, Hades, translated hell in your Bible, but it's, it's a certain place in hell now, not, it's Hades. Old Testament word for the same place is called Sheol. It's the place of the departed wicked. It is the place of torture in the meantime. It is like your sentence is to go to the parchment, but they're going to hold you in the county jail until they get ready to move you to parchment. So Hades is holding the unrighteous dead. They're being tormented and tortured in, in this little holding cell. Nothing like what they're going to be tormented because the place for the, for the final torment in the New Testament is Gehenna which means the lake of fire. So here's the rich man in the holding cell. Now, not, what I want you to notice is where it's located, all right? Uh, he lifted up his eyes and he saw Abraham afar off and he saw Lazarus in his bosom. Then he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in the water and cool my tongue for I'm tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, Son, remember that in your lifetime you receive your good things and likewise Lazarus evil things, but now he's comforted and you're tormented. And besides all this, between us and you there is a great gulf fixed so that those who want to pass from here to you cannot and the, uh, nor can those from there pass to us then he said well i beg you therefore father send him to my father's house because i got five brothers that he can testify to them that lest they come to this horrible place of torment and abraham said to him they have moses and the prophets let them hear them which means they got the word they got the bible the Bible tells them how to come to heaven. The Bible tells them what to do. And he said, they got the Bible, let them believe that. And, 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 and the rich man said, no, Father. Uh, but if somebody would rise and come from the dead and go back and tell them, they would believe. Now, we know that's not true. Why? Because Jesus rose from a grave and came back and told them, and, uh, and millions don't believe. Now, all I'm saying is that heaven used to be in a place in the earth uh, and it used to have a, a fairly close proximity to hell, to Hades. Because those in Hades could see those in, in, in Abraham's bosom, which I'm sure was part of the torture. They're down there burning in the flame and wanting a tip of water you know, on their tongue. And, and they're looking up there and they're seeing uh, people being comforted and, and, and at ease and enjoying the pleasures of life and everything they want and all that. And that's part of the torture. They can see it, but they can't get to it. Why? Because... Because God said there's a great gulf fixed so that people that want to go can't go. And even if we over there, even if we wanted to come down here and be compassionate on you, we can't break that gulf either. So that's where the departed righteous were when Jesus hung on the cross. Heaven was very near, but heaven is not there anymore. Because the Apostle Paul tells us. In Ephesians 4, listen to what he says. 
Therefore, he says, when he, capital H, if you could see it on the screen, Jesus is who he's talking about. When he ascended on high, when Jesus came up out of the grave and went to heaven, ascended up high, he led captivity captive and he gave gifts to men. Now just to make sure you know what he's talking about, the next verse says, now this he ascended, what does it mean? But that he also first descended into the lower parts of the earth. He who descended also the one, is also the one who ascended far above all heaven that he might fill all things. What does that tell you? It tells you that when Jesus came off of the cross and went in the tomb, he descended into paradise. <laughs> and he got all those guys in paradise, you know, Moses and Abraham and, and, and Joshua and, 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 and Isaiah and Ezekiel and Daniel and Nehemiah was down there crying and all. And I mean, you know, and Jeremiah was crying and it was just amazing. And Jesus comes down there and goes and descends Goes in there and says, hey guys, I got some good news for you. We fixing to get up out of here. I'm going to go to heaven and I'm going to sprinkle my blood on the mercy seat. And then when I do that, every one of you can come on in heaven. And I'm telling you, in a couple of days from now, we're going to do it. Let's just do a little worship right here. All right, let's go. Who's going to lead us, all right? All right, David, get that, get, yeah, get to our, come on. All right, they, and, and, and they just had, they had three days and three nights of worship and revelation and rejoicing and all of that kind of stuff. And then when after three days, Jesus has got to go back to heaven, he takes them with us. He empties out Abraham's bosom. He leads captivity captive and he carries them with him as he goes. And as he carries them with him, this is going to blow your mind. In Matthew 27, verse 51 and 52, listen to this. Then behold... The veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. This happened when he was crucified. And the earth quaked and the rocks were split and the graves were opened. Whew, here comes the... And many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised and coming out of the graves after his resurrection, they went into the holy city and they appeared to many. Holy... Jesus is on his way back up with them. And David said, wait a minute, Jesus. Boy, when we get past Jerusalem, can, I, can we stop a second? Because it's been a millennia since I've seen Jerusalem. And he said, yeah, okay, we'll stop a minute, but we can't stay now. Come on. And, then, and then, so they were just milling around in the city of Jerusalem. And a lot of people were saying, good. Did you see that? Did you? you know, I'm sure the jail filled up because they thought they were all drunk or something. You know, just amazing. But, but, but then he takes them on up and he goes in and sprinkles and then they get to come in. Jesus takes them somewhere. Where does he take them? Well, according to the Apostle Paul, he takes them to the third heaven. Three heavens, yeah, the, the one right here below the clouds, the one out in the space, and then God's. Three heavens. Paul, the Apostle Paul says in Acts 14, listen, the Apostle Paul was stoned to death at a little city called Lystra. They stoned him to death. Acts 14 Verse 19 and 20. Then Jews from Antioch and Iconium came there. And having persuaded the multitudes, they stoned Paul and dragged him out of the city, supposing him to be dead. However, when the disciples gathered around him, he rose up and he went into the city. And the next day he departed with Barnabas to Derby. I'm telling you, that Paul, that Paul, he took a licking and kept on ticking, didn't he? I mean... I mean, if you just got stoned to death one day, would you pick it up and go on a, a mission trip the next day with Barnabas? I mean, he just acted like nothing happened. Well, what was happening to Paul while his body was laying there dead? His body's dead. They drug him out of town. They stoned him to death. Look, you, do you know what stoning is? Stoning is not this little uh, pebble stuff that you see people, you know, they'll, they'll pick up a little something like that and they'll throw it and throw it. Uh-uh, no, no, no. They pick up rocks bigger than that. They pick up rocks like this right here and they bring it over there and they crash it down on you. Boy, they smash you. They mash you. They kill you. It doesn't take but about three of them to kill you. I mean, it's not like you're going to get buried with these little rocks. 
No, they're killing you. Ain't no, ain't no way you're not dead. They drag your body out of town and throw it in the garbage dump out there. So that's what you deserve. And then he pops a few, a few moments later, a few hours, whatever time, it doesn't say, that it says while the disciples were standing around him, all of a sudden he pops back up, says, hey guys, let's go in the city. I, I got to get, get my bags packed. Man, I'm going on a mission trip tomorrow. Here's what Paul said was happening. He gave this testimony several times. Here's what he said in 2 Corinthians 12. Now he's speaking in the third person, but he's speaking about himself, obviously. He says, I know a man in Christ. <laughs> I guess it is, because it's you. Who, 14 years ago, whether in the body, I do not know, or whether out of the body, I do not know, God knows, such a one was caught up into the third heavens. And he goes on to say, and I saw paradise. And I heard paradise. And guys, I wish I could tell you about it. But it, it, I saw things and heard things that it, 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 it are inexpressible and, and, and unlawful for me to even talk to you guys about. I'm just telling you, brother, I has not seen here, has heard. It has, has never entered in the heart of man the things that God has in store for us. Just imagine the Apostle Paul, the most articulate person that ever lived on this earth. Is there anybody more articulate than Paul who could explain theologies and understandings and mysteries and all? No, and here is the, here is the most, here is the most uh, promising man of all. Here's the most articulate man of all saying, I don't even have words to describe it. So, so our bodies reunite with our spirits. Let me read you this, uh, uh, 1 Thessalonians. When the rapture happens, our bodies are recollected and meet their spirits in the clouds with Jesus. And those of us who have never died go with them. Listen to this, 1 Thessalonians 4. But I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep. Koimeo, by the way, I meant to say that a while ago for you. It sounds like a Hawaiian word, but it's really a Greek word. And it means to be asleep like dead. And what the connotation is, like people go to sleep and they look like they're dead, but all you have to do is go over there and wake them up and they'll be alive again. That's koimeo. And that's what he said. That's, when, when people sleep in Jesus, that's the word that's used. Like you're asleep. Because what they were saying is, you may be dead, but you're not going to stay dead. You're going to get woke up by Jesus. And, and All right, let me go on. Uh, I don't want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. So when he comes back to get us in the clouds, in the air, he's bringing everybody that is is his spirit back with him right out of heaven. But now here's why he's doing it. Look at this. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. In other words, all of us alive, we're not gonna get favoritism and get to go first. Here's what he says. For the Lord, I love this, for the Lord himself, not some substitute Jesus, man, not some vice president or somebody, but the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. Is that a comforting thought to you, by the way? That is a comforting thought to me. I'm not going to be here forever. My, 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 my body's going to reunite. If, if I'm already gone, I, my, my spirit, you know, the Apostle Paul said to be absent from this body is to be present with the Lord, right? Well, you know your body stays here on earth, right? All right, you burn it up. You, you, uh, you fed it to the fish. You, uh, uh, you put it in a casket. Uh, whatever you did with it, you left it behind. All right, your spirit went to heaven. When Jesus comes back, your spirit's coming with you and your body's going to recollect 
and going to rise, and then we're going to rise. I, I, I guess the reason they rise first, and I've said it all my life, is because they have six feet further to go. I, you know, that's all I can tell you. But you're going to have a truly changed heavenly bodies. 1 Corinthians 15, I'm almost finished, y'all. Hang with me. 1 Corinthians 15. There is, all right, there is one glory of the sun. You, you, I know people ask all the time and they say, man, what, why do you think that we're going to look, I mean, we're going to be ourselves in heaven. There'll be something about us that's us, that we'll know each other. Yeah, well, and, and here's a passage. Here's a passage, look, 1 Corinthians 15. There is one glory of the sun. There's another glory of the moon. All right, can you tell the moon from the sun? Okay, so the sun looks a certain way. And by the way it looks, you can tell it's the sun. The moon looks a certain way. And by the way it looks, you can tell it's the moon. And another glory for the stars. Do stars look like the sun or the moon? Well, not to us from this distance. For one star differs from another star in glory. So this is the verse... This is verse 41, and I'm fixing to read verse 42. So that's the first, that's the verse that leads into what I'm about to say. And it's just saying that there are things that look different, and the things that look different are still going to look different in glory. They're not going to all change into some homogenized, amalgamated, everything looks like everything else, cookie cut or something. It's all going to be different. And let me read verse 42. So also is the resurrection of the dead. The body is sown in corruption, which means your body is decaying and your body is perishing right now, and it is. It is raised in incorruption, which means immortality. No more corruption, nothing to bring it down, no decay. It is sown in dishonor, it's raised in glory, it's sown in weakness, it's raised in power. It, all right, listen to this. It is sown a natural body, it is raised a spiritual body. There is a natural body and there is a spiritual body. And so it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living being. The last man, Adam, everybody say Jesus, became a life-giving spirit. However, the spiritual, this is so, so rational. However, the spiritual is not first, but the natural. So here's what, what it's saying. You don't, your spirit doesn't live and then your body. He says, no, the natural comes first and then the spiritual. In other words, you get a, a natural body first and then you, and then second, you know, you get a spirit. You get a spirit. The first man was of the earth, made of dust, which we are dust. The second man is the Lord from heaven. As was the man of dust, so also are those who are made of dust. Just like Adam we're made of dust, that's us. And as is the heavenly man, so also are those who are heavenly, angelic beings, spiritual beings. And as we have borne the image of the man of dust, listen to this, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly man. How simple is that? Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. In other words, if God didn't turn you into a spirit also, you couldn't even get in the kingdom of God. Because flesh and blood is not going to rule in the kingdom of God. It's a spiritual kingdom. So you're going to be flesh and you're going to be spiritual. All right, let me go. And um, nor does corruption inherit incorruption. Behold I, tell, behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep. What does that mean? Not all of us are going to die. We're not all going to die, but we shall be changed. We, don't, we might not die, but, it, but even if we don't die, we're going to have to be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible man must put on incorruption and this mortal must put on immortality. We will be raptured. We will be changed in the twinkling of an eye. And in a moment, we will become like Jesus and we will get our new bodies that are incorruptible and they will be the same for a trillion years or a zillion trillion 
or a multi quasi zig, whatever. There is no measurement of time in eternity. Do you know we only measure things that are limited? Where there's a shortage? Like, again, it's an example. D does anybody know how much oxygen is in this room? No, because we don't measure it. Why? Because we can have all we want, right? It's not in short supply. If we had a scuba tank and we were filling it with oxygen, would it matter how much we put in there? Sure would, because it's limited. But we don't measure that which is unlimited. Time now is limited. We have appointments we must make. We have work to go to. We have all kinds of things. There are limits on time. That's why we measure it. But when we get to heaven, there is no time in heaven because time is no longer limited anymore. And so for a zillion, trillion years, you know, I mean, we become immortal, incorruptible. We won't, and, and I don't think there'll be any vanity in heaven, so there probably won't be very many mirrors around, you know? I'm not sure where it says that in the Bible, but I know it's somewhere there, all right. Jesus is on the Mount of Transfiguration with Peter, James, and John, and Matthew says when Jesus got transfigured, it said his garments, the garments he had on, became brilliant, like translucent, <laughs> brighter than any cleaners on earth could ever get anything, you know? He just became, and, 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 and so uh, we, let me, let me give you a conclusion, all right? So we won't need makeup or beauty products. Everybody say Amen. We don't sleep and there's no light because there's no night there and we never get tired anyway. You always feel fantastic. You can run for 100 years and never get tired. You can run more than Forrest Gump ran. You can stay up and talk for 3,000 3, 3, years to the same person and never get sleepy, never get tired, and never get bored. One of the worst limitations we have here is time. We never even consider time. There, you're all, you will always be perfectly healthy. There will, there will never be another funeral. And you'll always experience physical pleasure for eternity. All right, what kind of spiritual, what, what kind of pleasures do you experience now? What do you enjoy? What makes your feet tickle? What makes you, what makes you happy? What kind of pleasure? Something you eat, something you drink, something you experience, somewhere you go, some person you're with. I mean, what is pleasure to you? Whatever it is, you're going to experience it forever. I got a whole message on that, by the way. But let me read you this passage, Psalm 16, verse 11. You will show me the path of life. In your presence is fullness of joy. And at your right hand are pleasures forevermore. How simple is that? When I'm in his presence, I'm going to be joyful and I'm going to experience pleasures forever. Whew, right, time won't matter anymore. Nothing will matter that matters down here. With our new bodies, we'll be able to travel at the speed of thought to other dimensions of space, worship Jesus for a million years with heaven's worship music and never get tired. We won't need a screen in heaven. We'll know the words. <laughs> we'll have perfect voices too, by the way. Everybody in here will be able to win American Idol if we really wanted to. We can travel the world and the universe and, and, and constantly explore. I saw, I saw a universe 12 light years away. Well, let's go. Bing. All right. Man, look at this place. It's unbelievable. It's just awesome. We can sit around and eat and drink for 100 years and never get full, never get fat, or never get bloated. We can go to a Broadway play and not get bored. It's miraculous. Stop. <laughs> this, is a, this is just our body I'm talking about now. We, we got some more. We got four more things to talk about. I know I'm taking all this time. I'm quitting right now. Except to say one thing. Israel's the super sign. Just keep that in your mind. The super sign is Israel. Everything begins and ends with Israel. Everything. I've told you that we're at the end. When did the end begin? The end began May 14th, 1948. That was the beginning of the end. The end of the end's right out here somewhere. Where are we along that line? Joel 3, for behold in those days and at that time. Specific time, specific days. In those days and at that time. 
when I bring back the captives of Judah and Jerusalem. When was that? May 14, 1948. I will also gather all nations and bring them down to the valley of Jehoshaphat. Same time, same generation that sees the birth will see the valley of, battle of Armageddon and I will enter into judgment with them there on account of my people, my heritage Israel, whom they scattered among the nations and they also divided up my land. Jesus is coming. You'll be able to sit there and listen to preachers preach for a zillion years and never get tired, never get bored. <laughs> Won't that be good? No, that's the other place. They have to listen to preaching all the time. All right, let's stand our feet. Thank you.